Let's uh, let's begin with a, with a word of prayer, and uh, then let's share some things. Father God, we again thank you so much for this beautiful day that you've given us, for this opportunity to assemble here to to look at the deeper principles of your word. Father, we're thankful for Heritage Christian University and for all the students that have come through here and all those that will be trained for service as a result of this, this uh, location. Father, we ask your blessings upon the things that we're talking about today. Pray that I'll be inspirational, inspiring, and instructive to all those that we hear. Bless us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I have a few handouts that uh, I want to share with you. Uh, we'll pass those out in just a minute. By way of introduction, um, my name is Robert Darby, as the paper says. I'm presently in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Uh, I'm privileged to be here with my mother. She turned 87 on yesterday. Uh, very, very instrumental in um, my teaching, training, and upbringing. Uh, mother is kind of interesting. She has uh, nine children. We were trying to think yesterday how many grandchildren she was, and, and we won't even think about the great grandchildren. Mm -hmm. um, but her and my daddy, uh, they have a great legacy, and we're just so proud of, of the fact that we were raised in Tusk County, uh, grew up at the High Street Church of Christ there. Uh, my father passed away about eight years ago. Now. Ten. It's ten years ago now. Uh, and so uh, that's that's about me. I want to deal with this topic that they gave me, uh, deeper ideas for community outreach. And I guess they figured that I probably had some insight on that because of, of actually where we are. I have a, a blessed privilege to be in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Anybody heard of Chattanooga? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, beautiful, beautiful place. It's considered the fourth largest city in Tennessee. Uh, and it's at an interesting location uh, it's about two hours from Knoxville, two hours from Nashville, two hours from uh, Atlanta, and two hours from Birmingham. And so all roads from major cities are coming into Chattanooga, hubbing, looking to go in other locations. As a result of that, we have traffic problems. Traffic is really not the problem there. Our problem there is a community-based problem. Our problem has to do with gangs and gang-related incidents. Last year, 2015, we had more gang-related shootings and killings than Chicago, Illinois. And uh, we, we're off to a good start uh, this year, having someone killed almost every weekend. Okay, More about that in just a moment, uh, and why that is important to community outreach. We realize that uh, the gospel call is to everyone. It's a call regardless of, of, of culture or circumstance. It, uh, it's a call that is to bring us out of darkness into the marvelous light. And as a result of that, I think that everyone needs the gospel. Why? Because God is not willing that it should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And while we were yet in our sins, Christ would die for us. Because of that, we have a perfect opportunity, first of all, for self for self-preservation. Okay? To work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. And then to assist others, to share our faith with others, in the hope that they too will embrace the gospel and be saved. And therefore, we have a thing called evangelism. Evangelism is dealt with in different ways in the church. Let me see if I can give you an example. Uh, if you were the child of the preacher, then you expected to come along and be a child of God. Are y'all with me? If your parents go to church, you expect it to go to church. But if you're in the community and the outline areas, sometimes you're not expected to do that. So how do we evangelize? Several ways. Probably the best way 
to share that with you when it comes to communities and community outreach, we're to go to scripture. Y'all got your Bibles? If you got your Bibles, hold your Bibles up high. Let me see about Repeat after me. This is the word of God. This is the word of God. I love it with all my heart. I read and believe and from it never part. For this is the word of God. This is the word of God. All right, we're on the same page. Go with me real quick to John chapter 4. John chapter 4. And since we're small in number, let me just do a little reading for you. John chapter 4, beginning with verse number 1. When therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John. I wish I had time to talk about that. Though Jesus himself baptized not, but his disciples. He left Judea, talking about Jesus, and <laughs> departed into Galilee. And he must needs go through Samaria. Then cometh he to a city of Samaria, which is Sychar, near the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Many of us know this story. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus therefore being weary from his journey set thus on the well and it was about the sixth hour. It gets interesting, verse 7. Then cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. And Jesus said unto her, Give me to drink. Community is strange, to say the least. Every community has a culture, just like uh, uh, he was saying earlier that, that every church has its own culture, it has its own habit, it has its own uh, mode of operation. Communities are different. Some communities are gated communities, where they're quiet and nobody knows their neighbors. Some communities are school communities, there's school traffic going through. There's a lot of kids around. And then there are some communities that are low income or housing communities. And we call those projects. Okay? Each community has its own makeup and it seems to have its own leaders and distinctive attitude. If we were to expect everyone to come from every community to the church building, it's not going to happen. You can invite those from your community to come to church. And if you're from the working class community, where you have jobs and you're raising your kids, then you can invite people and they will come to church. But everybody's not coming to church. This, this woman here is a strange woman. She is a Samaritan woman. She is not a Jew. She's not of the same culture. She's not from the same background that Jesus is. She's coming to the well to draw water at the noontime hour. Nobody in their right mind goes to the well to draw water, especially the distance they had to travel. They would normally go early in the morning while it's cool or in the evening before the sun goes down. She came at a different time, and the reason she came at this time of day is because of her background, because of where she was and what she'd been through. In our communities, we're going to meet people just like her. She asked for a drink, and she, uh, Jesus asked her for a drink, and she is, ex well, she's astonished. She's trying to figure out why you, a Jew, would ask me for something to drink. And Jesus says, if you know who it is that's asking you to drink, you'd be asking me to drink. Because the water that I will give you will create in you a well springing up into life eternal. The conversation came about because Jesus left the city. He left his disciples. And he is now one-on-one -on -one talking to someone who would have never gone to church, who would have never gone to prayer meeting, who would have never gone to a gospel meeting. As a matter of fact, she wouldn't even go to the well 
when other women are at the well because of her background. Jesus knew her background. He knew where she come from. He knew the things that she had forgotten. So he says, go get your husband and come back. And she says, I have no husband. Y'all know the story. And Jesus says, you say well that you have no husband, but you had five, and the one that you have right now is not your own. Now, I brought this up not to, to deal with marriage, divorce, and remarriage, but I brought this up because in our communities, there are people who have been caught up in the school of life. And I'm sure, no doubt, that there are many ladies out there who saw a man and fell in love with him. And when she put that white dress on and walked down that aisle, her intention was that this marriage was going to last forever. That they were going to raise up kids and grandkids together and everything was going to be fine. But somewhere along the way, her and that man either grew apart. Now, separations or divorces come for a variety of reasons. Death, divorce, disaster, they all create single women and a lot of times single women raising children. But does that stop the love that she has? Does that stop the nurturing and caring that she needs? So she tries again. And for some reason, it fails. And then again, and again, and again. And I'm sure you've seen it in your communities. I'm sure you've seen it in your churches where there are people who, who have given up on that hope of having the perfect family, the perfect marriage, the perfect situation where they can go to church and where they can serve the Lord. But I remind you what Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. I remind you what Peter says, that God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And so Jesus is at the well, and he's meeting with a woman who had no hope. And don't get it wrong, she knew a little scripture. Because when he told her about her, her life, her past, and her present, she says, I perceive that you're a prophet. And she did begin to, to speak about the Messiah coming. She had some scripture knowledge. She had some Bible understanding. And no doubt she had some hope by the things that she held in her memory and the conversation that she was able to have. There are people who will put their children on buses every day and send them to church. They won't come themselves because of their life, because of their background, because of the looks that they get, because of the smirks, because of the talking behind their back. In order to have true community outreach, I think it begins with the attitude of the church. I think it begins with us in the way that we see the lost, the way we see ourselves when we were lost, and where Jesus brought us from, knowing that he could do the same for others. So, community outreach then is reaching a community that is lost. And we do not discount any community. I've gone on campaigns. I'm sure y'all have too many out of DC. You've gone on campaigns. You've gone to these uh, uh, congregations that have middle class to upper class individuals. They got good money uh, on the road coming in. And they got all kind of money they're putting into the building. But very little is going outside. And someone said, well, you know, we're getting older and we're dying and we got to evangelize. Let's call the school, let them bring some guys down here, and they will take the gospel, and we will have some more members. Sounds easy, doesn't it? Until we get to the campaign, and we're knocking doors in the middle of the day on houses where they're at work. You know why they're working? Because they're middle class. They got jobs. They got careers. They got money. And they're not going to be found at home. At night, while we're back at the church having a gospel meeting, that's when they're home, and we're not meeting any of them. True door-knocking campaigns, true gospel meetings, are those where we go out and we don't just go to the communities, the gated communities, or, or the nice ivory communities with the stone hinges walls in front, but we go into every community 
the trailer courts, the housing projects, the low-income homes, the gang-infested neighborhoods. Y'all looking at me funny. Mm -hmm. That's community outreach. And that's where you meet people like the woman at the well. That's where you meet individuals that need the gospel. They need to know that Jesus loves them. They need to know that there's hope for their life, for their situation, for their circumstance, and for their future. <sighs> We've talked about a woman, but we fail to mention the children. Innocent, pure, childlike. The children of parents who have made mistakes, separated, divorced, going their own way. These children are innocent. When we consider community outreach, we need to consider the children. When we consider community outreach, we need to consider those who are so down on their luck that they're, they're, they're like the, the, the individual who's laying there at the, the gate of the temple and he's waiting on them, an angel, to move the water. And every time the water gets moved, he misses out because he has no one to put him in the pool. And Peter and John says, arise and walk. And he jumps up leaping. There are people out there who are hurting physically, mentally handicapped, physically handicapped, wounded, ill, and many of these are what we would call homeless. Oh yeah, many live in homeless communities where a bunch of individuals like them all gather together. And then some of them actually have places to themselves. Yeah, they're all homeless who don't want to be around anybody else. Hermits, you know, like some rich folks who go off to the mountains and be off to themselves. There are people like that. But the homeless, the helpless, the little children, the hurting, like the widows, the divorced, the diseased, all of these individuals are in the communities and they are needing some help. I've got here about three different outlines and uh, let me run it over here to you guys. I want to share some things with you when we talk about this past one. Past one right? um, when we talk about community outreach. And my basic topic was to give you some ideas about what to do when it comes to community outreach. Okay? The basic idea is always the same. Uh, See the outline say evangelism called 2 Peter 3 and verse number 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promises, as some men count slackness. Sometimes we, we think that simply to say that God is going to save us, but God has made a promise that the gospel will go into all the world. And that promise is to be fulfilled by us. And God is, is not slack concerning that promise. God needs us to do community outreach. Because he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Basic outline there. And this is really an encouragement outline for you. This is to let you know that first of all, the word and the will and the way of God is this. There's a determination that everyone has sinned and everyone needs to know that there is forgiveness for their sin. Hmm? The determination station is that we need to recognize the way of righteousness and we need to resolve to do better. And the way we do that is by we fulfill the gospel call. The Great Commission, Matthew uh, 28, verse 18 through 20, tells us to go into all the world. And we need to realize that that is a privilege to be able to go into the world and share the gospel with others. And then finally, the destination is because God wants everyone to be in heaven with him. 
I know that's right, John chapter 14. Uh, beginning with verse number one. Jesus says, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me, for in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. And where I am, there you may be also. That's the first outline. Second one is on the back side of that. What do I say? What do I do? Well, in the case of Jesus and the woman at the well, it was a simple conversation. I oh, wasn't about football. Okay, now, basketball, okay, Sweet 16. It, it's not about basketball, okay? It, it, it's not about any of our hobby things. Jesus went straight to the heart of the metal, and he'd start talking about water, living water, the word. He went straight to the matter. I want you to look at your life. You have forgotten your circumstance. You've forgotten your situation. You've forgotten the things that you've done. Has anybody here ever forgotten anything they ever did? Yes. Hmm? I've probably forgotten more than I, than I know. And the reason being, because it's something that I did, I want to forget it. The things that hurt you, that bother you the most, are the things that you try the hardest to forget. And we can look at individuals and say, oh, oh that's, he's a whiner, oh, he's a drunkard, oh, he's a whoremonger, he's this and that, he, uh, he abandoned his family and all that stuff. We can look at other people and we can see their sin. But we can look in the mirror and not see our sin. And this woman, deep down inside, knew why she was not coming to the well to draw water. But she had forgotten the reason was that she had a problem with men. And so, when you, when you talk to someone, your conversation should be, well, knowing nothing but Jesus Christ and him crucified. Watch how Jesus talks to her, though. He doesn't go in there and say, Okay, uh, I don't just be talking to you. Get away from here. You got you had too many husbands, or you got too many kids out there. You're raising, uh, uh, you know, you ain't got no friends. You ain't got no money. I should have said that one first. <laughs> you on welfare? You have no money. Why should I teach you the gospel? Uh, you live in a low income housing. Uh, you're gonna be a, well, you're gonna be a, a benevolent family <clears throat> for a while. But God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And I think all of us had a problem at one time or other. Some problems can be taken care of a little easier, though. Sometimes it may just be paying a light bill. Another time it may be trying to get someone to completely restructure their finances so they can pay their own bills. But all of us had some problems. But isn't that why the church is a hospital for the sick hmm? and not a resort for the wealthy? Oh, I wish I had somebody. What do we say? Three things. We make contact. And we make contact <clears throat> directed at who we are. We counsel them. Jesus said, go get your husband. I don't have one. But then, finally, we console them. We make sure that they know we care. Nobody cares how much you know until they first know that you care. Show them that you care. You want that conversation to go right? Show them you care. You want them to show up for a Bible study? Show them you care. You want them to come to church? Show them you care. You want them to come to church again? Show them that you care. It's all about us showing people that we care. Let me give you this. I've got, I've got three different things that, <clears throat> that we do. Let you pass these out. When it comes to community outreach, We have what we call programs. We 
have what we call prayers, and then we have what we call person to person. Let me give you this person to person chart. And I want to share this with you because I want you to look at this one from day to day. All of these are things that, that we have personally done at Inner City. These are things that we have done from time to time. Should I give one of these? Okay. All right. First of all, programs. This is something elder, elders do, and they they delegate to deacons programs. And some say, well, programs are not effective. I think programs are for a variety of reasons. One of the main reasons is a program gives an individual in the church something that they can look forward to, that they can be a part of, something that we can schedule, something that we can work out, and give everybody the, the, the chance and the opportunity to be a part of something. It's called a program. Let's put together programs. Let's do programs, and then let's solicit individuals to be a part of this program and to work in this program, because programs are good. Okay? Uh, if you if you're good at computers and with uh, software, then get you someone to help the, the church with their internet or with their advertisement. Okay, uh, I think I think every preacher needs to have someone recording his sermons and put them in two ways. First of all, an audio, video, CD, or MP3 or MP4, so it can be put on the internet, but also an MP3 or CD so they can be shared with individuals around the community. It's always a good way of, of outreach. But we've been doing that for years. There's another way that, that we tried some years ago, and we call it uh, toy teams. And what we do is because we have a bus ministry. Anybody know what a bus ministry is? Okay. A bus ministry is where you put together, a, it's a program, that you put together a team of individuals and you, you're going to need some people. You're going to need a bus driver. Bus can't travel without a driver. You're going to need a bus. You're going to need a bus captain. Somebody who makes sure everybody's there and everything is in place. You're going to need a learning station. Somewhere to take the kids to. You're going to need someone to serve food. You're going to need chaperones. You're going to need teachers. You're going to need disciplinary. You're going to need all these individuals. Now, a lot of these jobs can be done by two or three people. But as the program grows, you're going to need to grow it with people. What do, I, what do we call uh, a toy team? A toy team is a team of individuals that will look around the congregation at children that come in through the bus ministry and decide what we can do for them. If you've got a family that uh, the father's in prison, father's locked up, we say, oh, that's sad. they got a welfare for that. Well, what do we do with the mothers in jail and the grandparents or the aunts keeping the child? These children, they are going to miss out on a lot of things that the other children are doing. So you have a toy team. You find the kids in the congregation that in various situations, come birthday time, somebody buys them a toy and presents it to them get a family to shop for another family or, or a kid and let them buy toys for them for Christmas. Uh, your toy team is the one who, who makes sure that when a child comes in, if he's going to the nursery or he's going other places, that he has something to play with, that he has something to call his own. Most of these things will quiet him down. Okay? We do school supply giveaways. That's another program. Oh, that's a, that's a, a beautiful program. We'll open up our doors probably the Saturday before school starts, and we'll, we'll have kids coming from all the way down to the Georgia line and around three counties all coming to the church there so they can pick up uh, notebook, paper, pencils, ink pens, uh, the things that's on the school list. And from that list, people who would never come to your church will end up there for the very first time. 
And many of them will feel obligated. I like it here. They, they gave me school supplies. They fed me a meal. They was nice to my kids. We're going to show up on Sunday. And believe it or not, many of them will probably give you at least two or three Sundays before they stop coming. And if you can get someone then to see the child that comes in with the parent or with the grandmother, and they, they will get over there and meet their child and, and, and talk to their child and share with their child, even when mama or grandmother stop, is tired of coming or don't feel like going back, their child says, are we going to church Sunday? Are we going back? Usually it's the kids that end up will cause the parents to come or inspire them to come more and more. And by that, whenever we have an outreach, let's center our outreach not so much on the working parent, but let's center it around the child. Because if you notice, even in your home, your children get everything they want. You may not want to go to McDonald's eat. Or you want to McDonald's, that child wants to eat there. You want to follow that child. So if we will gear our program toward the child and addressing the child and nurturing the child and caring for the child, these programs will work so well. I threw down a black black party because you want to you want to be a congregation that sets into a neighborhood where everyone in that neighborhood has come to church or is coming to church right there where you are. You don't want all your members to come from across town for the need. After a while, they're going to get tired of coming from across town. You need people from that side of town, from that neighborhood. So you throw a block party just for that neighborhood. Yeah, a little candy, a little drinks, a little something to eat. But bring in some people that's going to help them. Bring in the fire department and have them talk to the people about fire extinguishers or smoke detectors and actually install them in their homes. Okay? Bring in the emergency management people, have them talking about uh, uh, you know, what to do uh, in, in an emergency, uh, whether it's an emergency or, or anything like that. Okay? Uh, bring in a uh, police department, have them talk about gun safety, have them to bring in their dog and, and, and run them through there. Okay? Anything that will attract the children, that you can encourage them and show the neighborhood that you care. Here's the fun thing. Community outreach also means going to the helpless or to the shed in. Okay? And, and and we got our list for communion. For the move for the uh, we do a lot of outreach programs, some of the same things that you do. Mm -hmm. um, we do grocery giveaway also. But okay. one thing that sticks out is the food bank voucher. I've never done that, so who do you use to get your vouchers from? And then is there an expiration date? Because a lot of times we have a lot of groceries left around. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm like to use the vouchers, maybe that would be. Okay. Uh, we, we do it two different ways. First of all, we have what we call a food box. Okay. And to, again, problems are good. You want to get the congregation involved. Uh, some of the uh, individuals, when they go shopping, they will buy extra rice, extra beans, this and that, and everything. If that's what's on the, the bulletin for that particular month. Okay. And they're bringing that, and we got a voucher box. Voucher boxes are good because you're going to have, because of their financial situation and the way they manage their money, there will be individuals who are not going to be able to make it from month to month. Okay, without a box toward the last two or three days of the month. Okay, and so that box uh, is the only one that that knows about that box is the congregation itself. Okay, and so you don't you don't give them a voucher and say you go at X Y Z and pick it up, or do you have the box? Well, we we have the, we have the vouchers as well, but we do the boxes so that we can have some there for those mm -hmm. immediate care, take care right then and there. Now we have uh, the Chattanooga Food Bank, and we have vouchers for that. Okay, uh, most of the congregations around the area have vouchers. When we run out of our supply of vouchers, and we do, because we are we're an inner city uh, church, and therefore uh, our voucher demand is, is plentiful. But we, we have three or four congregations around the area that I can actually send them over there, and I'll call ahead of time and say that, hey, I've already checked this situation out. Go ahead and, and, and listen to them. Uh, do what you got to do. Get them a voucher so they can go ahead and take care. The the countywide vouchers like that. Those, the record is, uh, is, is what is kept. And so uh, if they get one, they can only get another voucher every three months. It's good for 90 days. Within 90 day period, they can't come back another voucher. But 
in the inner city, there, there are going to be times when they're going to run out of food. And one thing that I do not want to do is see children go hungry because of the parents' lack of money management or other things that cause them to run out of money for the food. Okay? If she got her hair done, got her nails done, she had to buy a dress because her boyfriend's coming over, I don't know. The main thing is we got some children here hungry, so we got boxes here as well. And I think along with the voucher program, every congregation needs to have a food box. Does that make sense? But now the food boxes, are, we say are strictly for those that we know personally, those that come to church, those that are, are showing an interest in coming to church and coming to Bible studies, things like that. Does that make sense? Okay. Did that help you? It did, but I'm, I'm thinking, what's, I mean, we have the food box, but what's all on the voucher? I mean, is it more than your general food box? A voucher or is it generally just? has enough food for if it's a family of two or a family of four, they consider it like that. Uh, it has enough food to last that family for two weeks. Okay. Okay, so if, if they get paid first and third, and, and by the 15th they're out of food, they, need something, they go to a food bank, to the food bank, you know, they get the voucher from the church, take it to the food bank, and we pay pennies on the dollar for the food that they get. Okay, it's just a matter of signing up with, with your food bank and all that, and if you, you know, you, you're going to have your tax exempt number and all that, take that with you, you know, and uh, they'll, they'll ask for an administrator. An individual to actually sign and say, I'm responsible for uh, checking these out and making sure that everything is straight across the board. Okay? It's an easy process, but it's very beneficial. Okay? You're going to get a lot of people, uh, word gets around when people are giving away stuff. You're going to get a lot of people that's going to call you and they just want you to pay their light bill. They just want you to, to give them a food voucher. Okay? Uh, take the bitter with the sweet. There's no, there's no way that you can. Ensure that that doesn't happen. Okay, the phone company's been doing it for years, but if a woman's got five children, <clears throat> excuse me, and she owes for her phone bill and she can't pay that high bill, that first child's gonna have the phone put in this name. And when that, that bill gets taken care of, then the second child and the third child, there's a way to get around. It's a loophole for everything. Okay? But let's be straight up, let's show people that we care. Okay? Let's get them out of a situation. And I think every time somebody knocks on my door or calls my phone and says they need help with something, 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 I never talk to them on the phone. I said, okay. Uh, I'm free now. Where are you at? And I go to their house and I talk to them personally. The reason being, you want to see their surroundings. You want to see their circumstances. Okay? And that will determine a lot of things about what we teach because every time you meet with somebody you know we call it a Bible study but actually it's a study and it's an, it's an opportunity to teach someone and sometimes you uh, you got to teach them financial or you know or, or discipline or self-control do that in caring mode and then help them out and when you do they'll show up and then it's the privilege of the whole congregation to embrace them and show them some love and they'll keep showing up. Okay? Uh, even, even the best gatherer can go out and gather uh, you know, 15, 20 kids a week and bring them in. But if you got one uh, rich in the bunch, he can run them off just as fast as you bring them in. Again, let's teach our congregations, let's teach our people to love and to embrace all of our, all of our visitors. Okay? And, and, and not just the plain old flat. So good to have you here, and then walk away. You know, it is good to have them there, but find a way to not be seen through. Okay, find a way to to show you that you really care, that you're really interested in the child. There's nothing more. Have them sit with you. Come sit with me. Come on over here. It's a little piece of candy. Keep you quiet. It, it, open up right here. This and do that for the adults too. You know, give them a particular gum and, you know, help them with to find the, the song page and the, and the scripture and all that kind of stuff. But take a little time to show them that you care and that you invested in them and your outreach program will be great. Nursing homes. 
a lot of individuals in nursing homes and they really need somebody to care about. If you go visit someone in nursing home, uh, they tell you at the school, 15 minutes, <clears throat> pray and get on out of there, right? But if you go to a nursing home and if you really care about people and that person is having a good day and they want to talk, you might end up being there two hours, okay? If your schedule would permit. They have time and they need company. So what we do is we allow our young people to go to the nursing home. We'll set up a program with the, with the office and say, hey, can we bring our young people over here and have a Devo? Can we come over here on Sundays and, and have worship services? Okay? Uh, can we can we pick a certain Saturday and let's come over here and spend some time with these, these elderly people? Let's, let's have a singing. And we'll set our young people around them and they'll sing and they'll help with them and all that. And one of the most fun things that we do every summer is we have what we call a pimp my ride. Okay? Most of them in the nursing home are in wheelchairs, or they got no walkers. Okay? We go to the hobby lot and we buy all kinds of little glitter and stuff and paper and crayons and all that. And we go over there and we spend two or three hours hooking them rides up. And we let them help us decorate and, we, and then we take pictures with them and all that stuff. And later on we take the pictures back over there and in the in the, uh, the the what is it, the, the center room where everybody gathers. We'll hang them pictures up and everything, and, and we, we, at our nursing home, we still got pictures in there from six years ago, you know, where individuals have, and then some of them will take their pictures into their room, you know, especially with their little teammate or whatever, and it's wonderful to be able to do that, okay? Who knows, you might find a grandmother or grandfather to, to adopt you, you know, someone that really cares enough about you and call you their own. Oh, you're sweeter than my son, come on over here, you know? <laughs> That type of thing is wonderful. That's a wonderful outreach. And, yes, they're shut in. They're not going to be able to get out of there. Okay? But they got children and grandchildren. When you in their room visiting with them and they show up and see you, guess what? You just outreached. Okay. Sharing your faith is, is something that our kids do, and, it, and uh, it's it's not that minute It's uh, one of the things that our teenagers do as well. We teach them to just go out into the neighborhood with nothing but a business card or a program. Okay, we'll take one of the books, we'll take a program, we just we'll announce a special family and friends day, and have our children just walk around to the houses. Anybody come to the door? Have another family and friends day. You had fun the last time, didn't you? Well, we're having this on the menu this time. Come on over and join us. Okay? And you'll have a lot of people will show up, and you'll have a big crowd for that particular day. But weeks after that, you'll still have people coming in as a result of that. Just walking through the neighborhood, passing out flyers to announce our family and friends day. And that's what a family and friends day is all about. It's about making new friends and bringing new people in. Any questions? Any comments? Community outreach. There, there are so many programs, and one of the basic programs that I like is my prayer program. Okay, and I, I, I made that different because when you go knock doors, you want to pray with people. Uh, when you have community projects like Family and Friends Day, uh, we're having a, a uh, our community giveaway, or we give away clothing and food and things like that. Uh, you, you want to pray with people. Uh, whenever there's a funeral, we've had quite a few here lately. Whenever there is a, a, a hospital visit, or someone is shot, or someone's having a surgery, or whatever, you go there and pray. A great outreach is your prayer ministry. Okay? Uh, I got, there's one woman. Who, is, who after four years is a member at that inner city now, and she's very helpful as a result of our prayer ministry. I saw her at the hospital. I prayed with her when her husband was, was sick. He got better. She never showed up. He got worse again. She calls me to come visit him. We prayed again. We, yeah, we had a family and friends day. She came. She didn't come in. We prayed with her outside. After about three years, she came into services. I looked up one day and she was there. And I didn't recognize her because she wasn't what she, she spoke to me all the time, you know. And she came in, she listened to the lesson, 
And after a few weeks, she moved closer to the front, closer to the front. She got about halfway. She started coming to Bible study. She got baptized uh, about a year after that. And she's been in the church there for quite a while now. Okay? Prayer does change things. It does change lives. Again, it's all about showing people that you care. And then uh, the, 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 the last thing that we do uh, is person to person. Person to person is important. Everything needs to be one on one. Jesus had been teaching with multitudes of crowds. Crowds were so big, if he was in a house, you couldn't even get in without taking the roof off and letting somebody die in the roof. Okay? A uh, crowd so big that, that you have to reach through the crowd just to touch the hem of his garment. But then, here's a one-on-one -on -one situation. There are no disciples. There is no crowd. There's Jesus with this woman. And he is talking to her heart to heart, face to face, person to person. And he's sharing with her. There's no substitute for person to person outreach. We got a homeless guy. We got, we got two homeless communities right by the church. We got a homeless guy that he sees me almost every Sunday as we're loading up the bus to take the kids home, and he'll come over there, and he'll ask me to give him a dollar. Okay? And I know most of the time he's coming, so I, whenever we're heading back to the neighborhoods, I grab one of the little care bags that they give the kids. By care bag, I mean chips, cookies, uh, uh, stickers, gum, something to drink, things like that. And uh, I'll grab one of those and give it to him, and he is somewhat content. I found out a few months ago, but actually last year, that uh, three of the kids that are showing up belong to his sister. And they come because he was eating some candy that we gave him as a care package out of the church. He shared it with his sister kids, and now they're coming to our church. You never know who you're touching or how far it goes, person to person. 